Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Toyota 2GR engine and how it works. Now this is a 3.5 liter V6 engine out of a 2013 Toyota Camry. And the reason why it's here is because the old water pump broke off and that overheated the engine, probably blew the head gasket. So we're going to tear it down to see just what happened and what are some of the common issues with this engine if you're looking for a car with one. Now the GR series of engines replaced the MZ series of V6 engines, which you can click the link above to check a teardown on that. Now taking a look at some of the engine's features, there are some similarities with the old ones, such as having a plastic intake manifold as well as an all aluminum head valve cover and a block design some of the bigger differences up in the valve cover here is that you've got dual variable valve timing under the timing cover if you got a timing chain instead of a belt the water pump is now driven off the serpentine belt instead of the timing belt and then the intake manifold doesn't extend over the rear plugs so it's a lot easier to do spark plug changes here but we're going to start this tear down by removing this intake plenum which was already loose now this just like the old ones have an acoustic air induction system looking at the top here we've got the lower intake manifold that bolts directly to the two heads they also hold in the port injectors because this version of the engine comes with port injection only the lexus versions came with both port and direct injection for more power and better economy out of surprise to see is that the fuel rail here are just made of plastic and not metal like the old ones. I'll just take off those fuel injectors there. Now I can pop this guy off. And you can see the advantage of port injection. The back of those valves are nice and clean, so you don't have any carbon building up affecting performance. Now one thing I like that they've done is they made the crossover tube for the coolant made out of metal as opposed to it being made out of rubber for the whole thing. Next up we're going to remove the coolant inlet. There we are. Next up moving to the front of the motor, we're going to first remove the thermostat housing here. Okay, we'll pull off this accessory bracket here and we can pull off the thermostat housing. You can see the thermostat lives inside of here. Now here we come to one weak point on the two GR engines and that's the water pump. These water pumps are not reliable and they like to grenade themselves. Now while it looks easy to replace here, inside of a front wheel drive application like a Camry or even a RAV4, it's right up against the inner frame rail here and it's pretty difficult to access all these bolts. As a matter of fact, in the Toyota service manual, they ask you to remove the engine and transmission in order to access this water pump. Now in this case here, we've got a brand new water pump put on this engine after the old one broke. And when they tried to turn the engine over, something didn't work, and they knew this engine was toast. The alternator and AC compressor would normally sit over here. I'm going to first remove these two idler pulleys. Alright, see if you can get this water pump pulley off here. Alright, bunch of 10s and 12s hold this one on. Alright, and there's the water pump. And there I've got a brand new water pump that I can save from my car. It's 18 bolts to hold the water pump on. That's crazy. I feel like they were still using multi-layer steel. Wow, this is a pretty hefty gasket. I'm just going to remove these accessory brackets along with this tensioner. All right, and here's your belt tensioner assembly. Now the valve covers are metal and for good reason. We have your variable valve timing solenoids that run directly to power your VVT gears. This engine has variable valve timing on both the intake and the exhaust side. Over here you can see we've got this metal pipe here which is actually the oil feed and that is another weak spot on earlier versions of this engine where they used to make it out of rubber. It would deteriorate and burst and then you would lose oil pressure and potentially shut down the engine damaging it. Well, this oil feed line connects down to the head over here. It's got a union bolt like this and the other union bolt over there. And this here is the metal line which they've updated on earlier versions prior to 2010. There was a recall to replace this with this metal line. And there's the oil feed for the rear valve cover. Next up we're going to work on the valve cover bolts and I don't like that they're switching between 10s and 12s. I'd rather if it was just one tool to remove everything. Wow, that's really, really clean. Now taking a look at this interesting valve cover design, obviously Toyota can't use a plastic valve cover because you've got oil channels in here that come up from that tube to feed your two VVT gears. Taking a look underneath here, you can see these are the two solenoids over here. They're going to distribute the engine oil pressure down into these two little holes over here, which are in turn going to fill up these two cam phasers. I do have another video on how variable valve timing works. You might want to check that out linked above. Now, one thing I don't like about this design is the fact that you've got to bring oil up into another piece, which is this valve cover over here, which opens the potential for leaks and loss of oil pressure. Most engines will suffice with sending oil pressure through the camshafts themselves to lubricate it and up through the head into the VVT gear without doing anything with the valve cover. Now later versions of this engine did switch this whole VVT setup in the head here so that it uses a plastic valve cover design. Now this is probably one of the cleanest engines that I've ever taken apart. There's no tarnish or oil stains anywhere. Now just like the 2AR4 cylinder Camry engine of this era, 
Sierra. This engine also uses a ladder frame design here that encases the camshafts themselves on top of the valve train down at the bottom. So you can actually unbolt this entire section with the camshafts and remove it. So I'm going to use the pressure of the timing chain to break this free. Stuck a screwdriver in there and we're going to break this crank bolt. Okay, that was too easy. There we are. Alright, let's tackle the rear valve cover. And just similar to the other side, we've got a line going here that's going to support oil to lubricate all of these camshafts over here. We've got your two variable valve timing outlets over here to control these two variable valve timing gears. And it's just as clean as the other side. Now next up, we're going to remove this timing cover. We're going to remove all the 12 millimeter bolts. Now unfortunately, as with most engines, in order to take the cams off as well as the heads, you got to take off the timing cover. But to do that, you got to take off both oil pans at the bottom, so we're going to flip this over. Taking a look at the bottom of this 2GR engine, we've got a stamped steel lower oil pan with an aluminum alloy upper oil pan and then the aluminum block. You can see we have a cartridge style oil filter over here. I'm going to go ahead, you got to use a special tool for those. Jeez, I'm going to need my breaker bar. Okay, alright let's wind this off and see what we got here. Okay, I don't notice any obvious particles or damage, but it does look a little milky in there, so I wonder if coolant's mixed in here. Now there's a lot of oil in here, so I'm just going to use my wife's old polka dot dress to sap that up. So it doesn't make a mess when I turn this engine back over. Alright, next we're going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold this oil pan on. There's the oil pan, kind of sludgy in there. And if you look closely, you can see those little bubbles inside of the oil. That's evidence that oil and water or coolant has been mixed. All right, next up, I'm going to remove this lower oil pan from the engine block. There's a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts going all the way around and inside here that I'm going to remove next. Right, let's see if we can wave this guy off here. Yeah, we'll remove that with the oil pan. It's not really a structural piece. Now taking a look at the oil pan, we do have this oil baffle here and the oil pickup tube which looks pretty clean. That feeds into the oil pump located at the front here in the timing cover which is directly driven off of the crankshaft. Bunch of 10 millimeter bolts, hold this on. And here is the baffle. It's interesting, it's kind of sludged up and stained on the one side. You can see overall everything's got a milky residue kind of coating on it. Again, that indicates coolant and oil mix somewhere. But taking a look at the bottom end of this 2GR engine, things aren't really looking very good. You can see that there's distinctive burnt marks around this crankshaft where this bearing is overheated. As a matter of fact, these two middle bearings seem to have a little bit of play, so I wouldn't be surprised if the bearings are worn out. The same thing can be said for these forward bearings here, and you can see how they're overheating. And then the rear ones here, you can see again, there's burn marks back here. So this engine definitely overheated. It probably starved itself of oil or oil and coolant mix somehow, and that lack of lubrication cause these bearings to overheat. Now one of the gooder things about the Toyota V6 engines is that they use a nice piece of steel inside of the aluminum block. Not only does it provide strength, but they've also cross bolted it on both sides. So you've actually got six main bolts here, two on the outside and four on the inside, which makes these nice, strong and reliable engines. These are a 12 point, 12 millimeter socket. Yeah, the bearing's clean. Clean, like brand new. So it appears while it overheated, it didn't do any mechanical damage to this. All right, we're gonna knock off this timing chain cover. I removed all the bolts from the bottom and from the front. And there's the timing cover. Now timing cover leaks are a little bit of a common issue, especially on older 2GR engines. You can see the oil pump itself is actually bolted to that timing cover. At least it's a replaceable part and not integrated. We've also got this oil galley here that comes off of the oil pump and goes into the engine block. Again, that's another point of failure that other manufacturers get away with and not put critical oil components in the cover. Let's get that rear main seal out. Better remember to unbolt this before you put it on the engine stand. Here we've got a look at the timing chain setup upside down on the 2GR engine. Got the crankshaft over here that powers everything. And that's going to power this long timing chain that powers the two intake camshafts. And there are secondary chains that power the outside camshafts for the exhaust. In the middle here you've got an idler port. And we've got these timing chain slides over here along with your hydraulic timing chain tension. Alright, I'm going to go ahead and start loosening up some of these pulleys here starting with the intake. Then I can release this timing chain tensioner. This slide is actually made of metal, which is nice and strong, and then this friction surface is made of plastic. I like that. There you go. Right, this one off. These things are only held in by dowels, there's no bolts. Take it off of the idler, and you can take the chain off of the crank, and this is your timing kit. Now at the top here you've got your crank position sensor, and this wheel that's pressed on. 
And this here is the crank gear. Get to remove that. All right, last step before I flip the engine over, let's get this crankshaft out of here. I'm gonna go ahead and knock off these 14 millimeter 12 point bolts. We'll zip these off. All right, let's not forget that these are also cross bolted mains, so I gotta remove the bolts on the side of the block too. And now I can remove the crankshaft from the block. Now I can flip the engine back upright so we can take off the head. Whew, it's heavy. Now in order to get the camshafts out of the way so I can get to the head bolts, I'm going to remove this cam tray over here by removing all the 12 millimeter bolts. That'll remove the entire assembly with this top piece over here together so I don't have to deal with individual camshafts and cam cap bearings. There's the tray. And the 2GR series of engines uses a hydraulic lash actuator. So you've got a little plunger over here which is hydraulically actuated with the oil that's running through here. And that's always pushing up against this little roller over here. And this roller is what's touching the camshaft. So any clearance that's built up between the valve and the camshaft is taken up by that hydraulically. So you don't need to do a valve adjustment. And that should make things wear a little bit easier and quieter. Just gather all these here. Here's what one of those hydraulic actuator looks like. It's just a cylinder that's being pressed up against the hydraulic oil coming through here and that's just going to push up against your roller. Now head bolts on Toyotas are usually a bi-hexagon 10 millimeter but you can get away with using a normal hex especially if you're not going to keep the engine bolts. They're still using separate washers here and not an integrated washer into the head. All right now I'm going to remove the head and again you can see more of that oily coolant mixture all over here so if this head gasket fails it probably won't be as clear cut it could be as simple as a cylinder being warped also look at this this yellow stuff is very clean engine oil it's not coolant because coolant's supposed to be red and over here on the back side of the engine we're going to pull out the valve tray with the camshafts a bunch of 10s and 12s and we can pull this off now i'm going to remove these little rollers here now i'm going to crack the head bolts loose then I'll go ahead and zip off these head bolts. And I can remove this head. Taking a look at the head gasket, you can see it doesn't really sit that flat. So I'm going to reckon when it overheated, it probably warped, and that's what caused the oil and coolant to mix, as opposed to actually blowing the head gasket itself. Yeah, and you can see there's more of that oil residue in the coolant jacket. I'm going to remove these accessory brackets here to hold these crossover tubes on. And these are the two knock sensors. And I can peel that off. I'm glad they kept the knock sensor wiring harness a separate piece because this tends to get really brittle down inside of the block and then it could break and instead of replacing the whole engine harness just replace this piece. Let's flip this over and get these pistons out of here. Now that everything's torn down we'll take it off the stand and take a close look at this engine. So here we've got all the components laid out for this engine. We're going to take a look and see how it works. Now let's just get straight to the meat and potatoes. The 2GR engine is a very reliable engine if it's well taken care of. In this case, the owner neglected it and caused it to overheat with a bad water pump. And that's what caused the head gaskets to give up. Now because the blocks are aluminum and the heads are aluminum, well, they're going to warp when things overheat. And you can kind of see that in this head gasket here. This is the front one. You can see it's all kind of warped and bent out of shape. And the rear gasket is even worse. You can see that it's significantly bent out of shape. And that's after having sat squished between the head and the block. It just comes out looking like that. Now when your head gasket becomes compromised, the coolant from the outside of this jacket here and around the head here is going to mix with the oil to either the oil pressure ports at the top here or the oil drain back and that's going to cycle coolant through the oil. Now the coolant can do a good job of lubrication and oil can do a good job of cooling and then you end up overheating the engine. Now I'm a little surprised because most cars would automatically shut off to prevent engine failure in the event of overheating but this owner probably took it a step further and literally drove it to hell. Let's take a quick look at the lubrication system on the 2GR engine and it actually starts over here on the timing cover where we have the oil inlet from the pickup tube tube which is going to draw in oil it's going to use the rotation of the crankshaft here in order to create oil flow the oil is then going to exit down through this port over here and head over to the upper oil pan and the upper oil pan houses the oil filter housing and then that filtered oil is then going to head back up through to the timing cover oil is then going to head up back through the oil pump housing and timing cover back up to this main galley port over here where it's going to go to the block now oil from the timing cover is going to head down to the main oil galley down the middle of the block where you've got the main bearings that are going to tap into it to lubricate the crankshaft as well as these sprayers here which are going to lubricate the cylinder walls and the bottom of the piston
piston head. Now over on the timing side you can also see these castings for the galleys over here that's going to run oil up to the heads through these ports over here. Taking a look at the piston head on the 2GR engine, it's quite hefty, it's got a bit of weight to it and a fairly large diameter. In terms of the condition it was actually pretty good, the rings move pretty freely and the oil controlling isn't completely clogged up and when it does get clogged up of course your engine's going to start burning oil. It's really the EPA that's driving this because they want you to get better fuel economy so the manufacturers have to use a thinner oil so that it slides better but then a thinner oil means that these oil control rings are going to clog up a lot faster. Of course if you look at a lot of older engines such as the M series of Toyota engines that I made a video on the oil control rings are a lot more bigger because they use thicker oil. I think this was the worst offending piston you can see a lot of that oily coolant sludge built up in between here and that's just because the oil and coolant is mixed together to form that slurry. Now moving on to the head here, this is where the lubrication system gets a little bit more complicated. You got two oil feeds going to the head here, one on the timing side here which is going to feed the variable valve timing and timing chain tensioners and then one at the top here which is going to feed the rest of the valve train system to lubricate it. Now the top of the head here you can see there's two main oil galleys that run the length of it and those are going to house these little hydraulic lifters which sit inside of here and just due to the oil pressure it's always going to try popping it out against these little rollers here so that it can always keep pressure against the camshaft and you don't have to do a valve adjustment. Oh yeah, if you're getting a little clatter at startup from the top end of the engine, it's probably due to these hydraulic lifters not getting enough oil. Just wait a little bit for the engine to warm up and it should go away. Now the feed from the block for the valve train components is going to end up over here and then that's going to interface over here to the valve train assembly to this hole over here. I'm going to take off the camshaft so we can see how the oil flows. Alright, we'll take off the cam caps over here. These are actually all fixed together. Now in order to lubricate these cam bearing surfaces, if I remove the cam cap here, you can see you've got this groove that's going to bring oil from that hole across the two cam caps. In addition, the oil is then going to split off through two holes over here, down to the bottom here where it's actually going to feed back into the head. Now that oil is then going to come back through these two holes over here where it's going to fill the two oil galleys for your hydraulic lifters with oil. In addition, there's another two pairs of holes here that are going to feed oil back up through the valve train assembly. And that's how these two middle cam bearings are going to get lubricated through these small little holes here coming back through the head. So it's a little complicated where you got oil coming from the block through the head then through the valve train assembly back across this way then back down into the oil galleys and then back up to lubricate these bearings. There's a lot of oil passing between this interface here as it lubricates everything. Yeah so we're not done yet there's also an additional hole on the top of this cam cap here which is going to interface with the valve cover itself to provide oil over here to spray on top of the camshafts. So if you thought that part of the lubrication system was interesting, let's take a look at the variable valve circuit. So the first hole from the front of the block, we've got oil that's going to come up from the main oil galley into the head over here. It's then going to come through this galley here and then out to this hole here where it goes to that external pipe that leads to the top of the valve cover in order to provide the valve cover itself and the solenoids with oil pressure. In addition, there's another circuit here that feeds off for the hydraulic chain tension. And then there's another circuit here that taps off for the other hydraulic chain tensioner the tension is the chain that goes between the intake and the exhaust side. And here's what that chain tensioner looks like between the intake and the exhaust side. You can see the oil is going to feed through here and that's going to fill this with oil so it always keeps tension. Moving out to the valve cover, this here is where that oil pipe is going to thread into to supply oil to the valve cover. You've got your two variable valve solenoids over here and that's going to provide oil feed to the valve train assembly. Now over here on the valve train assembly you can see there's two holes here, one to pressurize and one to release from the variable valve timing solenoid that's going to send oil through these little grooves over here in order to phase the camshaft timing. Now while the GR series of engines have proven themselves to be fairly reliable, I don't really like the design of this lubrication system because the oil has to travel through so many different components which creates failure points where oil could leak and you could lose oil pressure and possibly damage your engine. Essentially if you think about it, oil comes from the oil pan straight into the timing cover where the oil pump is, then it goes to the upper oil pan to get filtered out, then back into the timing cover, then into the block, then from the block to the heads, then from the heads into the valve train, then from the valve train back into the heads, and then you've got a separate circuit for your variable valve timing that goes into the valve cover and then back into the valve train again. It's just a lot of components that have interfaced together that I think they could have simplified, especially for such a critical system like the lubrication system. And there you have the infamous 2GR 3.5 liter V6 engine from Toyota. I think it's kind of sad that they're replacing this with a 2.4 liter turbocharged engine. Time will tell if that'll last, but if you got one of these still, make sure you keep an eye on that water pump so this doesn't happen to you. And subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.